Good afternoon, Westcombe. It's been a long time. My name is Matthew Pavlinovich. I am the chairperson of Midland and Districts Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Back to Westcombe Day. I'd also like to uh, uh, introduce my other committee members. I'm going to point them out. Um, Jude, Jude's at the back uh, doing the scanning on, on the laptop. Uh, Richie is there on the camera. And who else have we got in here? Out, out there is, uh, is Mark, uh, Don, uh, Susan, and Judy. Now, 70 years ago this year, skilled migrants and their families from across Europe answered the call and answered the West Australian Government Railway's call to cover a worker shortage we were experiencing at the WAGR workshops in Midland Junction after World War II. The majority of those skilled migrants and their families went on to establish themselves in our state and contribute to the fabric that made our state what it is today. Today, we have many of, of those original pre uh, present. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mary Winter, who arrived here uh, in 1951. And I think, Jean, were you, you in 1951 as well? Yeah, so um, I wish to acknowledge both of them. Uh, for me personally, uh, the journey to recognise Wexcombe started before our society was formed in 2017. It was one of the issues that I had, that I had developed a passion for uh, as a child, uh, coming from a migrant family myself. It all started back with my Facebook page, Remember Midland, in 2013. It is where the rebirth of Wexcombe begin, began. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Joanna and Peter Rip, uh, Diane and John McCracken, and Jane Sweeney, who assisted to reopen the can of worms Wexham through photos and information sharing on Remember Midland. When our society was born in 2000, 2017, it provided the opportunity to further push for the acknowledgement of Wexham. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Marion Chaplin, uh, Catherine Ritchie, and Jean Bond for their assistance in providing further photos and information. Today we come together to acknowledge and celebrate the history. I, ho I hope it will ignite friendships and your, your reunions will continue after today. Those residents that are no longer with us and cannot be here, we remember them. I know they are looking down on us today with a big smile, seeing everyone back together again. Now, what I'll do is, um, I'm gonna go through a presentation uh, in terms of the history. Um, it should take about 20 minutes or so, it'll be some slides and I'll explain everything through that. So uh, the history, uh, we'll start with um, the Aboriginal history. So uh, significant uh, to the Aboriginal people, Blackadder Creek, uh, a, spiritual, a spiritual place for Noongar people uh, as it's the home of the green Bullfrog Dreaming Track and the Dreaming Track of their ancestors. Also, Jane Rook, uh, which is the home of the sacred turtles. And both Blackadder Creek and Jane Rook uh, run close to Iowa or through Wexcombe. Now, uh, Euro European history uh, Swan Location 13, known as Ashby was assigned to Captain William Dance in 1829 and it consisted of 5,000 acres from the Swan River where Vibash is today up to the top of Red Hill. Swan location 13 was then divided uh, into two, two and a half acre lots or plots in 1832 and the land uh, was transferred, one, one plot was uh, transferred to William Tanner uh, and then the other, well, it all ended up with William Town after uh, William Dance, um, and then both were transferred to Dr. Samuel Waterman Bybash in, in the 1840s. Now, Swan Location 13 uh, remained known as Ashby. 
Tree, and it's where Dr. Samuel Waterman Ivash and his family built their homestead. And that's today the suburb of Ivash, uh, where that homestead was. As you can see, um, the family in front of the Ivash family in front of the homestead. Um, just trying to point out this guy here with the beard. That's um, Samuel Samuel Waterman Ivash. Swan Location 13 was given the name Wexham, uh, we believe, after uh, the, the place of origin in Wiltshire in the United Kingdom, where the Wyvash family came from. Now, the original boundaries of Swan Location 13 ran, we uh, ran west to east from what is now Great Northern Highway in Midland uh, to Wyvash Road in Swan View. Now, uh, in terms of uh, it's the, the area's military history, um, now not a lot. We know that there was military presence there. Um, this map here from uh, 1914 uh, indicates that a rifle range uh, existed um, on Wexham, where that where eventually in between 1942 and 1944, um, Bellevue Camp 3 and 4, uh, that's, that's where the camps were uh, for World War II. So we've got this photo um, showing, uh, this is the back of, I think it was the back of Hunter Street, um, and these were the remains um, of the military camp. So if anyone knows the area now, um, I can probably say that uh, Stratton Inquiry, there's a street called Inquiry Lane, that is where the military camp was. It's obviously houses there now, a whole few suburb, but that, that's roughly where it was. Now, welcome migrants. So after World War II, uh, West Australian Government Railways took over the former military camp, and uh, WAGR put out a call to, in Europe uh, for skilled migrants to fill positions at the WAGR workshops in Midland Junction. Uh, the first migrants arrived in 1951 uh, with, the, uh, with WAGR providing decent huts uh, to accommodate uh, the migrant workers and their families. Now in 1953 it's believed that there were 400 people uh, living there. Now, uh, a new suburb is born. Now, this is the map um, that we found, uh, which indicates uh, we've got a map in there on the whiteboard, uh, which we asked later on if you can have a look. It's got all the, um, the house numbers on it. Um, if you can put um, yourself and your family, every person of your family that lived there, and if you know the year and the address, to put it down on a piece of paper because we're trying to track where people lived um, in, the, in the area. Obviously, you had different periods from the early times to, to the, later, you know, the later days. Now, this main road here, that's Murchison. Um, this area here and, and this area here were never built. They were just proposed. So all the, um, you can see all the black dots here indicate um, you know, where, where the huts were. We know that the lot numbers ended up being the house numbers or the hut numbers. Um, so on that map, a clear map, you can see that. Um, here, that's the shop. Um, and this here is uh, the workshop. Now, there was a workshop, I believe there was a workshop, is that correct? Yeah, so, but you can have a closer look later. So the challenges uh, that were faced for the first migrants um, that arrived. Now, uh, the, the first one they encountered was um, accommodation. Um, they got there. Now, I, I believe a lot, uh, when the migrants came over, uh, went to Point Walter first, um, and then ended, ended up at Wexcombe. Now, the Nissan huts weren't, the Nissan huts weren't completed. Um, and I believe there was about two months there when um, they had to sleep in tents up there. So uh, that, was, that was the first challenge. 
The second challenge um, is isolation, um, because at that stage, um, Midland, you know, in our, in, in our um, looking at it today, you know, we're five minutes drive from there, but, you know, it, it, back then, you know, the ca cars and that and technology, you know, it, it was further away. So that, that, that was another thing, uh, water supply, and also uh, sewage, uh, toilet pans, which I believe um, did, did eventually, um, I think most, the, 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 the residents that lived there in the early days would remember the pans um, and the, the laneways behind the houses with the, uh, when the truck used to come up and pick up the pans. Well, that, um, that ended up, I think, uh, back in, I think even the 60s, um, they ended up doing away with that and they brought in a syringe, um, which today at the site, uh, there's evidence of um, septic tanks and um, leach drains and stuff like that. Now, types of accommodation. Now, there was the Predominantly, there was the Nissan huts, which I believe came in three or four designs, um, and that was three. There was you know three bedroom, two bedroom um, ones, and also Austrian prefab homes. Now, the Austrian prefab homes they came in at about 53, 54. Um, WA purchased 150 of them um, and got uh, got some workers from Europe and Austria, Germany to come over, put them together. And uh, some ended up in Wexcombe, some ended up in Midland here, which we, we, that we know of. There's four left in Midland, um, but they're the only ones left. And the predom they were predominantly along Murchison as you came in um, into the area. Now, this is two photos of, um, of a Nissan hut and an Austrian prefab. Now, uh, Nissan Hut, that's, that's obviously the standard, some had, some had rangers like that, some, some were very different. Yeah. And that's of an Austrian prefab. Now the interesting thing, someone told me that the Austrian prefab um, brought in, uh, when they brought in, they brought in timber, uh, that they brought in the European wasp to WA when, the, when that came in, so I don't know how true that is, but um, now, for the first migrants, um, 12, 12 of those families who had been living at Wexcombe uh, combined uh, to build uh, new family homes in Yokine. Now, those 12, uh, out of all the, uh, I'll read out all the names, so you had uh, John Ritchie, uh, John Gray, Len Winter, uh, Ken Brown, Ernie Shaw, uh, Jim Rayside, Bill Wilson, uh, Alan Tilly, Arthur Farmer, Jack Brooks, and David Manson. So those 12, uh, those 12 uh, families, uh, they had mutual cooperation with the West Australian Housing Commission and they were able to obtain building lots um, and loans to cover the cost of the building uh, in Yokine. Now, father and sons, uh, who, all these uh, gentlemen here, they were all qualified tradesmen working uh, at our workshops. Uh, they assisted each other to build, to build the new homes. Now, all, all 12 homes uh, were completed within three years, and the families relocated from Wexcombe to Yokine. Now, Wexcombe's transition as the federal government uh, migration schemes uh, changed, uh, so did Wexcombe in the 1960s and 1970s. Many of the skilled migrant workers and their families uh, went on to establish themselves in our society, and uh, Wexcombe remained predominantly home to second generation West Australians and families who still worked at the uh, WHR workshops in Midland. Many apprentices called Wexcombe home, and for them and their partners, it was the foundation for, the life, for their life together. Now, the demise of Wexcombe 
Um, a decision was made in 1976 uh, that all remaining tenants uh, would be moved uh, and the area would be decommissioned. Now, a number of the Nissan huts uh, were sold off, relocated to private property across West Australia, which we know that there is one standing in Hitchigana. Uh, there's one in, in, uh, in between Northern and York, but it's uh, derelict now. Um, while what was left remained and fell into disrepair and was eventually uh, demolished. What remained was the road system, um, with that being used uh, for, uh, by various car clubs for events. Uh, local driving schools used the road system for, uh, to teach their students. And also a model aircraft club were using Murchison Avenue as a runway. For the next 20 years, uh, that's how Wexcombe remained. Uh, on March 1989, uh, the suburb name of Wexcombe ceased to exist and was replaced with Stratton. Stratton named after John Peter Stratton, who was a farmer, businessman, and nearby landowner of Jane Brook Stud on the northern side of Telbert Road. Now we found, I have found no evidence to say that John Peter Stratton actually owned the property, owned that land where Westcombe was um, on the south side of Tolga Road, uh, with the landowners recorded as the Defence Department, uh, WA Government Railways, and finally the State Housing Commission. Now, um, a lot of stories I've heard that um, he used to, Stratton used to have his cattle and everything used to come through, um, but I don't whether he just used that area for grazing, um, I think that's probably the, the, what had happened, and there was, he actually didn't own a the pro the property there, so. With, with, a, with a new suburb of Stratton underway in 1990, the old Westcombe road system eventually succumbed to development and disappeared. Evidence during the development shows that in the years after Wexicum and the start of Stratton uh, occurred, uh, that the area had been significantly downgraded due to human behaviour. Now, uh, if you understand what human behaviour means, I was just describe, put that nicely to say it was used as a rubbish kit, pretty much. So, Now, preserving and acknowledging the past, uh, Midland District Historical Society discovered the remains of Nissan Huts on the site in 2017. An online petition uh, to Parks and Wildlife was created for them to be, for, for the remains to be preserved and, and the site's history acknowledged. Uh, we received four, over 460 signatures. <laughs> Uh, we were successful in preserving the remains. Uh, we were lucky because the site has now been classified as an A-class reserve. It's a nature, nature reserve, so that made it easy for us to uh, to obtain, obviously, the, the, to, to get it confirmed that it was going to be remain. Um, the part where the, the site where the remains are, that was destined to be the last, the final stage of Stratton. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, so, in terms of how it became a nature reserve, uh, we, uh, most of you know that Tonkin Highway to Muche, uh, the Tonkin Highway that they built. So, somehow, main roads, uh, when they build new highways, um, for the bushland that they destroy for that highway, they have to reallocate bushland elsewhere in a metropolitan area for, uh, you know, for preservation. So effectively main roads um, gave hand of the land over to um, Parks and Wildlife and they extended the, the existing Telbert Road um, Nature Reserve and incorpor obviously incorporated it all. So we're going to work with Parks and Wildlife um, in the coming years to interpret the site, uh, the migrant history and uh, re-vegetate the area. At the moment, Parks and Wildlife already, have already started uh, revegetating the area um, and actually they're trying to remove weeds. Um, and they've also cleaned up uh, rubbish um, 
there was a lot of rubbish that had to pull out of there. There's still some in there, but they pulled out most of it. And uh, that were, and that area has now been fenced, so it's preventing um, people from actually going in there and dumping rubbish. So now our society uh, will apply for funding through various sources uh, to to get the estimated cost of five five to six thousand dollars to cover interpreting um, the site. Now we looked, um, we haven't for officially firmed what we want there, um, but one of the ideas is to have a covered information board, which in the in that nature reserve they already have um, information boards covered, information boards, and that will obviously interpret give you the history of the area. Um, but we're looking at doing something different, um, and they've got a standard uh, triangular, triangular uh, roof um, we're looking at getting a, a custom-made uh, information board that's the shape uh, of an Nissan hut um, as part of it. And we'll also continue to work uh, with Parks and Wildlife to improve access to the site. Currently there's a fence um, and you have to hop through that fence to get to, uh, to, to, get to the remains. Um, we're looking at getting a gate put in there as in a pedestrian gate. There is a gate, a vehicle gate. Um, but we're looking at getting a pedestrian gate so people can walk in um, you know, at their pleasure. Now, um, in regards to the remains, um, we can confirm that uh, the remains uh, exist of uh, 203 Mersey Street, 205 Mersey Street, uh, 209 Mersey Street, and 213 Fitzroy Avenue. So, if anyone lives there, <laughs> now that's all um, how, how we found how we found the, the locations um, through that map um, that I previously showed you uh, plus uh, thanks to Landgate we've got uh, aerial photography uh, dating back to 1953 uh, so we overlay existing um, map to back then and that's that's what came up. Now this is a map of um, of the reserve. Uh, it is the 16 the additional 16 hectares. Now uh, that's the existing Talbot Road Reserve. That's Stratton there and that's Jane Brook. This road here is Talbot Road. Now this area right here is where the remains exist. Now, um, the, the access point is in this area here. There is a gate, there's this. So if anyone wants to go and have a look, you know, feel free to go and have a look. Um, there, is, there is a gate there, but you could fit two cars, park two cars there and, and walk in. Just uh, some photos of, um, this is the entrance into the nature reserve. That's uh, the remains of 209 Mersey Street. I think the, the former residents are here. The June and John are here. Yep. Now, 205. Now we can't, as it's a nature reserve, we can't go, we can't go in there and dig the place up to see what else we can find. Um, but after 45 years of it being um, pretty much like a tip, um, and whatever was valuable has gone, um, but you know, I think these remains, there is something, there's 203 Mersey Street. This one's probably the best um, example of, uh, of one, in, one intact as in... Um, now, that's obviously the toilet and the, and the um, septic tank, yeah, and laundry. the laundry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there's nails in the ground. There's, um, there's nails in the ground here from 
you know, when they pulled when they pulled out the timber because most obviously the timber around the majority rest of the house was it's all timber flooring, so that's long gone. But yeah, there's still remnants of nails and stuff in there as well. Uh, Two thirteen Fitzroy Avenue. Now this the interesting one is how how quick that these trees grew around around this one. Now this property would have faced the front of this property would have faced where that house is now, where that fence is, and the road would have been on the other side. Because as you'll see in the coming photos, uh, that's the laneway. So that's the laneway that existed between um, the houses that faced Mercer Street and Fitzroy Ave. Um, that's the laneway that, where the dummy car used to go. <laughs> Other remains that we found, uh, uh, we found this uh, lead strain here, which uh, is obviously later on. Um, that came in when, when the sewage system came in. Uh, wrought iron pipe here, which we believe now, thanks to someone uh, with, with some uh, information, we think we know that led to that led from the, the huts. It led to this pit. Now, this was our uh, we we traced everything else. We couldn't work out what this was, um, and I thank Jeff. Because Jeff, after speaking to Jeff, um, he remembered uh, in the later days that it was actually a drainage sump there. Now we had people, uh, we had people saying it was a swimming pool. We had people saying, also people saying it was an air raid shelter that they used it for war and that they parked cars under there and that they were looked. But I think we can confirm now that it was, that it was a drainage sump and that pipe. Lead, uh, we still think leads to to that um, to that sum. We're going to look at uh, this area here. We're going to uh, because there's some collapsed walls which are going to be removed, um, but the majority of the wall there will stay and will get cleaned up, um, and will just stay there as you know as a as a to, as a um, you know landmark. You know, but we even asked um, we try to ask. Um, there was a horse stud next door, and they were there in the later days when uh, there was nothing there, when it was abandoned, and we didn't. They 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 couldn't they couldn't work out what it was. Um, and through Langa, on Langa aerials, it's not there in the early days because there wasn't many trees. But uh, in the later days, when there was trees, we couldn't see anything. So now our next steps. Um, how you can help. So we, uh, our society is aiming to develop a comprehensive collection of photographs. So if you have any photographs to share, um, please contact our society or if you brought them along today, um, after the presentation, Jude's at the back um, with a scanner and a laptop. Um, now we've also, um, our society is looking to, uh, would like to record your own story at living at Wexham. Now, this is done through uh, oral history recording. So far, uh, Catherine and Jean, uh, we've got their stories, uh, they've told their stories. So if anyone's interested, just contact our society. And then we'll keep everyone uh, up to date on what's, on what's going on with the project. We're estimating uh, to have the signs up in, in about two years. Um, if everything goes, if everything goes well, the guy that, um, that we're dealing with the Parks and Wildlife, um, he's um, been quite good, um, and he has, um, you know, he's he's done stuff like this before with, uh, with uh, you know, in other areas. So he's experienced with that. So um, he's experienced and he's able to assist us. Thank you for coming. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs>